So yes, this talk is an overview of the hash equivalent service and PR service within Open Embedded and Bitbake. Um, so first of all, just a little bit about me. Uh, many of you already know me. I've been involved in Yocto project since around 2013. Um, but for those of you who don't, I'm Paul Barker. I work across the whole embedded stack, so kernels, bootloaders, BSPs, things like that. I currently work as principal engineer at a hardware design company based in the UK called SandCloud. Um, and you can go to our website if you want more about SandCloud. Contact details, um, email, website, Twitter, are all there. The one that's probably relevant during the conference, if you want to ask me any follow up questions, is my nick on IRC is Paul Barker. And this talk in particular has a couple of acknowledgements and shout outs that I want to give. So several of the updates described here were things that I worked on while I was working uh, at Consolco Group, which is a previous role of mine. Um, and that work was funded by Automotive Grade Linux Project. Um, so, you know, great company to work with and great Automotive Linux, great project to be involved in there as well. And this is some of the contributions that they've made towards the Octo project. I also want to give a specific shout out to uh, Joshua Watt, who did some of the initial work on the hash equivalent service, and Scott Murray, who wrangled some of my patches into a form that would actually work upstream. So um, without those two, we wouldn't have the features that I'm discussing in this talk. So um, the, the order of business for today, uh, first of all, I'm gonna talk about the PR service, then I'm gonna talk about the hash equivalent service, um, then I'm going to talk about recent developments, so things that have changed since around the time of the Dunfell release. And then I'm going to talk about future work in these areas. And for each of the PR service and the hash equivalent service, I'm going to first of all look at what the problem is that they're trying to solve, then how the solution works, and then how you can actually use it. So don't worry if these things are unfamiliar to you right now. I'll try and provide some of the background as we go. So first of all, the PR service. So the problem that we're trying to solve here is that if we want to support on-device updates, so that is updates using packages, so RPM feeds, DEB or RP, IPK feeds using sort of a traditional package manager approach, um, then the revision of each package needs to increment each time a package is rebuilt. So if you change something in the recipe and rebuild, that needs to be given a higher version number so that it will be installed in preference to a previous version you'd built when you do like an apt update on a device. And manually modifying the package revision for every change that you make to a recipe, it's inefficient and it's very prone to accidental error. So that isn't really the way we want to do things. So the PR service tries to solve this by maintaining a database of input hashes for each recipe. So for each recipe that you are going to build, it hashes together you know, the contents of the recipe, the classes that are inherited, the different sources that are used to build that recipe, and all of the dependencies that you're using. And it maintains a database of these. And so each of those individual input hashes is mapped to a PR value um, that is added to the end of the version string for a package. And so when a new input hash is added, now a new input hash means you've changed the recipe, you've changed one of the sources, or you've changed some dependency. Uh, what the PR service is gonna do, it's gonna assign a PR value that is one higher than the maximum PR value that it has previously assigned for this recipe. So that means each time you change a recipe and rebuild, you get a new PR value and you get this continually incrementing version number that is nice if you wanna do package updates on a device. So how do we use this PR service? Um, now, it's, it's, if you want to use this on one machine, it's pretty simple. Um, there's a fragment in local.conf.sample.extended, which is kind of the extended version of the sample, that you can copy into your local.conf file and you can uncomment, or you can just set this uh, PRServe underscore host variable. 
and if you set it to localhost colon zero, what that's going to do is it's going to start PR service automatically um, and configure itself automatically. It's going to start with Bitbake, it's going to shut down when Bitbake is done, um, and it's going to use a database that's just in your um, work directory. So that's great if you're just using the PR service on one machine, but let's look what happens when we want to use this across, um, you know, across a network. Maybe you've got an auto builder with multiple people pulling from it. You can run a, the PR service manually. Um, so you can specify the IP address and port to listen on for the PR service. And you can run these commands that are on the slide to start and stop the service. And if you do this, then what you need to do in your local.com for a build is you need to set that PR service host variable to the IP address and port that you're using. Now that could be localhost or it could be something else on the network. And this will allow you to share one PR serve database across multiple builds or even multiple build machines. Other things that uh, the PR service supports is exporting and importing data from its database. So this lets you do a backup and restore or transfer from one build machine to another, that kind of thing. So um, if you've sourced the um, setup script, so you're in an area where you can run Bitbake, you can run this Bitbake PR serve tool and you can say export and you can give it a file name that you want to export to. And for every recipe, it will dump the um, PR values out to that recipe, out to that file. Now with export, the converse of that is importing data. Um, so you can run this Bitbait PR tool import, give it the set of file um, that you'd previously exported to, and it will import all that data back into its database. So that's it for the PR service. We're now going to take a look at the hash equivalent service. So the problem that the hash equivalent service is trying to solve is that typically tasks are, build tasks are re-executed when their dependencies have changed. And some dependency changes don't actually have a, an impact and result in unnecessary rebuilds. So Let's say a change to a recipe changes a header file that isn't actually used with the package config that you've got. So it doesn't actually affect the, the output of that build at all, but because there's been a change in a dependency, everything that depends on that is gonna get rebuilt. Now you can manually set the SIGGEN exclude um, variables to um, prevent this from happening, but as, with the PR serve case, doing this manually, it's inefficient and it's prone to making mistakes. So again, we don't want to do these things manually. We want a tool that helps us. A hash equivalent service is that tool. Um, what this tool does is it maintains a database of input and output hashes for every task that results in some kind of estate archive. Input hashes as before depend on the, um, the recipe, the sources and all the dependencies. The output hash is a hash of, you know, what actually gets created as the estate archive. Now, if you change something and you get a new input hash, if when that task is built, it results in an output hash that's already been seen before, um, then it marks those corresponding input hashes as equivalent. So it's a little tricky to get your head around at first, uh, and I'll point at some other resources in a second. Um, but then once we've got this idea that two input hashes are actually equivalent because they generate binary identical output, we can recompute all the input hashes for every single dependency using these matched input hashes. So say you've got 50 other things that depend on your library where there's been this inconsequential change, the hash equivalent server will help you avoid having to rebuild all those 50 dependencies unnecessarily. So for more information on this, because I know it's a little tricky to get your head around sometimes, um, I highly recommend looking at the presentation uh, that Joshua Watt did uh, last year at the Embedded Linux conference. There's a link to the YouTube talk there and link to the slides on elinux.org. 
and these my slides are on the conference website with clickable hyperlinks if you want to follow any of those so how do we use the hash glove on service um, again there's some fragments we need to add to local.conf um, and for the hash equivalent service we need to set two things we need to set the bb hash serve to auto and we need to set the signature handler to oe equiv hash um, and this second one just you know stick with the same uh, value we've got here the bb hash serve equals auto similar to pr serve what this says is bitbake is going to start and stop a local hash equivalent server with every build but again, if we want to set, share um, one hash governance database across multiple build directories or across multiple build machines, we can run a standalone hash governance service. And there is this bitbake hash serve command to run the service. And you can give it the dash B option to tell it to bind to a particular um, socket. Now, this supports Unix sockets and it supports uh, an IP address and port to bind to and if you start the service manually and you want to use it from your build you set the bb hash serve um, value in local.conf to either the path to the socket or the ip address and port number that you're using and that will let it connect to that um, hash service I just want to give one brief aside about the hash equivalents, because what it's doing is it's saying that uh, multiple input hashes would correspond to the same output hash for a task that generates an estate archive. It's really only useful where you have access to those estate archives that it's referring to. So if you want to share hash equivalents data between multiple build directors or build machines, you really need to also be sharing the estate archives um, for those to be usable. Um, and shared state can be served via a local directory, it can be shared over an NFS share or HTTPS. Um, if you want multiple builds to write their shared state to the same directory, you can share it with a local directory or an NFS mount. Um, you can use HTTP or HTTPS if you just want to share this in a read-only way. So that's been an overview of both PR serve and the hash equivalent service. What I now want to talk about is some recent improvements that have been made. So everything that I've covered so far um, should be available in sort of the Dunfell version, the LTS version. Um, what I'm talking about here is things that have been added since then may only be available in more recent versions. So first of all, some under the hood improvements. Um, I'm going to run through these very quickly. Um, we've replaced the older RPC methods, uh, particularly with for PR serve with more modern RPC. We've switched things over to asynchronous codes. So this should remove a couple of bottlenecks. We've improved testing in these areas. And um, in particular for hash serve, there's been a, a change last month um, that should improve the estate reuse even further with the hash equivalent service. Um, but then sort of features that are more visible. Um, so the PR service has gained a read-only mode. Um, so you can pass the dash R argument when manually starting the PR service. Um, and that will start a server that um, silently ignores new data. So it will not add new PR values into the database. And this is useful when you want to share the PR values from um, something like an auto builder, but you don't want downstream builds to add um, new PR values. The Hash equivalent server has also gained a read-only mode. Um, you, again, you pass the dash R argument when manually starting the hash serve. And in this case, operations which would modify the database are rejected. Um, again, this is useful if you want to share the hash equivalent data and estate from some sort of auto builder. And again, you don't want the 
the downstream builds to add data back to that hash equivalence database. So the other thing that the hash server has gained is the ability to um, connect one hash equivalence server to another upstream hash equivalence server. So this um, lets you have a local hash server alongside your build or on your build machine, which is read write and gets updated with uh, new data when you run builds. But then you point it at and read only upstream that might come from something like an auto builder. And um, that won't get data about your builds that are just on your machine, but you will be able to pull equivalences from that auto builder. So it allows some amount of shared state reuse. Um, and the, the benefit here, instead of directly connecting only to a read only hash serve instance, is it still allows um, the hash equivalences to be detected within your local shared state. So that's it for the recent improvements. Um, let's talk about the future work that can be done in these areas. So <clears throat> one of the things that needs a bit of improvement is being able to share the PR server data efficiently. Um, so this idea of having a, a, a local read-write service that is then connected upstream to a read-only service is only implemented for hash serve. So one thing that would be really good to see is for that to be also implemented for the PR service. Um, so again, you can point directly at a read-only PR server instance, um, but then the, the values may not be correctly incremented for, for local changes. Um, and in both of these cases, um, you know, builds from different users or machines within a team uh, may end up with the same PR values, even if the input hashes are different. So since these numbers are just incremented linearly, there's nothing to avoid um, conflicts if two people on different machines do uh, new builds of a recipe. Um, and if you are then publishing that data to a package feed and trying to update on the board from packages, uh, that conflict might cause a bit of confusion. So these are areas that um, could do with a little bit of work within the PR service. Um, and then on the hash serve, um, we've got kind of the, the converse problem. So the um, sharing over a network is implemented, but data export and import aren't implemented. Uh, so one thing that would be really good to see added is yeah, data export and data import for the hash equivalent service to allow you to perform backups uh, and to migrate data across machines. Um, other things that are useful would be better introspection tools. So that is sort of command line tools to query the databases for the PR serve and hash serve. So for example, it'd be good to have a quick way outside of a build to run a command that will just check the highest sort of PR value allocated for a recipe. You can then compare that to what you're seeing on your device. And you know that sort of thing helps with debug. It'd also be good to um, collect some stats in the PR service about how it's being used. That may help to, um, uh, if you're working on performance improvements or seeing some bottlenecks and you want to understand what the cause of it is. So the hash server already has the ability to collect statistics and query them. It'd be good to see that added to the PR service as well. Another area that's ripe for future work on both these tools is test coverage. So um, HashServe already has some basic stress testing. Um, the, it'd be really good to see stress testing for the PR serve as well so that we can improve the performance of both of these tools. Um, for HashServe, the, the stress tests that are in the source just work locally. It would be good to have something that we could run um, to kind of stress test things over a network and just look at how things work with different latencies. Um, for both of these services, I think it would be good to have better testing of the 
service uh, start and stop. So um, I don't think we quite have full coverage on the Yocto Auto Builder of um, starting and stopping the hash equivalent service with every build because the Auto Builder uses a persistent hash equivalent service. Um, and for the PR service, I think the Auto Builder does the automatic start and stop. Um, but that means it doesn't test out a persistent PR service as much. So again, it'd be good to have some test cases for those, even if they're not things that run every single time on the auto builder. Um, and then it'd be good to have some unit tests in Bitbake for PR surf. So at the minute there are test cases in open embedded core for the PR server. Um, it'd be good to have some tighter, smaller unit case unit tests that just live in Bitbake and just test the service and its database handling on its own. And so those are my thoughts on future work. Um, also welcome any other ideas people have to improve these tools. Um, so yeah, as a summary, um, the PR serve tool supports on-device package feed updates by ensuring that package revisions are incremented each time a recipe is rebuilt. The hash equivalent service is used to improve uh, shared state reuse by allowing insignificant dependency changes to be ignored um, and to ensure they don't result in unnecessary rebuilds of everything. And both services have seen recent improvements and both have great opportunities for future work.